Welcome back to another weekly GMBN Tech Show. On the show this week, we have some top spec YT Capras. Some new bikes from Orbea. Also an active spider to counteract suspension kickback. And some amazing stuff from you guys, including actually, probably the world's first wheel made from cable ties. <laughs> Insane. Okay, so straight into news and let's take a look at that YT Capra Elite model. Oh, will you look at this bad boy on the screen right now. Yeah, so this is their top of the range enduro race ready enduro bike. Um, it's based on a Capra, which of course we know that's a, basically a mountain goat. This thing can do whatever it damn well pleases. Just look at it. It's got that Fox 38 on the front, 170 mil travel, 170 mil travel out back, carbon frame. And you know what, before we look at some of the specs, the price alone. Okay, so this is their top flight bike. It's about $6,000, the same in euros, about 5,400 in pounds sterling, as far as I remember. Um, yeah, that's a lot of money, but look how much bike you get for that money. If you compare that directly to some other brands out there, it's insane what you actually get. Now, some more shots of it on screen. I'm sure you're gonna to wanna to look at this thing. So, the color, dark suede. First up, the color looks really, really nice. It's funny how you're getting the approach now, a lot of bike manufacturers are having this darker, more subtle look to their bikes, more earthy tones. I love it, personally, I think it's great. That said, I've got that bright red canyon, which I equally like, but it's a completely different thing. That's very much a racier theme, but this just looks, well, it just looks right to me. Yeah, so it's running on 29 inch wheels, which is also right to me. Uh, it comes in four sizes, medium through to double XL. Okay, so the sizing, right, so as I say, medium through to double XL, 440 up to 500 mil reach. Okay, so 500 mil reach for double XL. It doesn't sound crazy big. It sounds more like an XL to me, but the fact that they do those four sizes is effectively an extra large, isn't it? It's just a, it's like having a small through to extra large. Um, good sizing, I think. 500 mil on a 29er with 170 mil travel. Whoa, that thing's a beast. Uh, what else we got? So 65 and 65 and a half degree head angle on the front. Plenty of slack enough. Any slacker than that, and then you're gonna, you're really gonna have to wrestle the thing the entire time unless you're running at like, Mac 10 speeds. Um, I find a slightly steep head angle actually is more beneficial to a lot of people these days. I think people want to go slack and slack and slack, but they actually dull down some riding. So I think that is about bang on. I probably wouldn't want to go any slacker. Um, certainly not on a 29. I think that would feel really good on that. So 75 and a half to 76 degree effective seat angle in there. So not the steepest, but it's definitely steep enough to winch that bad boy up to the top again. Top spec on there as well. So you've got SRAM uh, Eagle X01 on there. You've got E13 LG1 race wheels. And the tires are cool. So again, race ready tire set on there. You've got a set of Matisse as a guy on the front. And then you've got a Mini and DHR2 on the rear. So a really good combo there. Uh, the as guy, we know that's the Greg Minar tire. The DHR2 classic combination. It's got those aggressive ramp shaped paddles. Really good for braking, especially that one. And you're going to need to be braking when you're going to go fast on that thing. Uh, Renthal cockpit, it's got the Apex stem and a fat boy carbon bar. Um, literally all the stuff in it. SRAM code RSC brakes with 200 mil rotors front and rear. You're going to need them on a bike like that. Uh, a few more shots. I think it looks amazing. What do you guys think of YT bikes? You love them? You hate them? What do you think? Keep it cool in the comments underneath. Okay, next up in news is something from our friends over at PT's. Now this is their new link loop, it's the dry version, right? So it's a wax-based loop, and you do need to put it on a really clean transmission. But, here is the but, this is quite cool. So it hasn't got a solvent carrier, instead it has a water-based emulsion. A little bit different. So why would it have a water-based emulsion? Well, the solvent carrier we know evaporates, and that's a really good thing for getting those particles into the chain. But it can't, apparently, according to the PTs guys, um, it can't carry as much wax. So it's not that good for a wax-based chain in mountain bike terms. If you want to use a, a wax-based chain loop on a mountain bike, you need loads of the stuff to get in there. And apparently water-based emulsion gets uh, double the amount, nearly double the amount. So uh, 35 to 40% more than, I think that's right, um, than regular. So by all accounts, it sounds really good. And a wax loop, if you bother to clean your chain, is going to be really good and very low in terms of friction. But, uh, well, I'll leave that one up to you, but there it is. Uh, it retails for 12 quid for the 120 mil size. Uh, it's half that, uh, 7.99 in fact for the 60 mil and 2.99 for a 15 mil. Um, I like the idea of a small one that you could take with you in your riding bag though. That's a good idea. Although I'm not sure you'd want to put it on when you're out on the trail. But uh, 
Anyone out there used wax lids? What do you think of them? Um, I typically steer clear of them, but I do know people that absolutely love them. Um, if you're obsessed about cleaning your bike, then I'm, I could see the appeal of them, for sure. But that might not be me. What do you use? Wax lube, wet lube, or dry lube? What's your favorite? Let us know in those comments. So also in the news, we see two new bikes from Orbea. So there's the Oiz and the Alma. We'll talk about the Oiz first, which is the full suspension XC race bike. So it comes in the 100 mil cross country mode, or you can get the TR model. Now that has 20 mil additional travel front and back. That's by having a longer stroke shock as well as a longer fork. So with these bikes, there are three different choices of material. There is the OMX carbon fiber, which is their top tier stuff, and I'll give some more details on that later on. There is the OMR, which is a slightly more affordable carbon fiber option, and there is the alloy version. Now, yet again, with a modern cross country bike, and it seems to be something of a trend, they're doing away with the pivot at the back and just kind of relying on the flex of those stays. This makes it a lot lighter, essentially, as well as there being benefits in terms of less maintenance, I suppose. They also have a pretty cool thing called the Squid Lock, which is kind of a tongue in cheek name for remotely actuated compression adjustment. So you can really lock out your fork and your shock in unison for climbs. Now that's gonna prove a hit with XC races. So you can change this spec to suit whatever you want it to be really with their MyO program, which is actually cool to check out really, even if you're not in the market for a new bike, some of the paint jobs are pretty jewel worthy. Now to look at the numbers, it has a 75 degree seat tube angle. Now this is a really interesting number because with trail bikes and enduro bikes, they're getting as steep as 78, 79, maybe even 80 degrees now. But as that comp becomes steeper, it becomes harder to ride with a saddle at full extension. So you need a, a seat post with a longer drop. Now this proves a bit of a crossroads for a cross country bike because they basically have to choose between having a dedicated dropper only setup or trying to cater to people that still want a lightweight build. And that's why you might see some cross country bikes with more traditional seat tree numbers, some as low as you know 72 or 73 degrees, it, because it makes it far easier to ride with the saddle at full extension. If you don't believe me, just try riding a bike, a modern trail bike with the saddle up high and yeah, it's pretty, um, pretty challenging and not in a good way. So the head tube angle is 69 degrees, which is relatively steep actually, which isn't something I thought I'd be saying for a bike like this, even just a few years ago. But paired to that slightly steeper seat tube angle, it is gonna be, I imagine, remarkably planted when this climbs get a little bit steeper. But looks like a cool bike all round, four, five, six reach for a large, so relatively healthy as well. But that wasn't the only bike or bear were launching. There's also the Alma, which is the 100 mil travel hardtail, which is for the purists out there that want the lightest bike possible for a short travel XC rig. Similarly, it's also available in alloy, OMR or OMX. Now the OMX carbon is made lighter because they get these sheets of it and they laser cut it so very, very precisely. Now what that means is it reduces any overlap, which is essentially not needed because that's just excess stuff that isn't needed for the function of the frame, but is gonna add some weight. And it also ensures there's no added material, you know, kind of fluffing around the joints or anything like that to really make it very lean indeed. Interestingly enough, if you are in the market to pursue that ultimate lean cross country bike, you can even spec it with a rigid fork. So that could actually be a really good halfway house for somebody that wants to do some gravel or kind of more adventure style riding as well as maybe hitting up some trail centers. So I think that's pretty cool. The head tube angle is actually a shade slacker at 68 degrees as is the seat tube angle at 74.5, but it is a beautiful bike and some of those paint jobs are absolutely breathtaking. Now they have the seat tube and the top tube really built for compliance here while trying to maximize the stiffness on the other parts to hopefully give a good blend of power transfer and comfort. And that's really important in a hard sell, especially something that if you wanna be pushing it maybe on those long adventure rides, you do want something with just a little bit of give. So next up in the news is something from 9.8 and this is their Slacker headset. So you've probably heard of angle adjust headsets before and what they do is they enable you to run a Slacker head tube angle by changing the angle at which the steerer tube runs through the frame. But this is actually tackling a problem which has been around for a couple of years now. Because if you have a bike that doesn't have an integrated headset, so that's one where you press cups into the frame, 
there are actually quite a lot of options for angular just headsets but if you have something that does have an integrated headset that means the race is actually part of the head tube and isn't something you can really go changing well you might have found yourself limited to run the stock head tube angle which might not be quite what you want so as you can see with these drawings the slacker kit actually relies on the bearings in that internal headset but it actually adds a bit of a cup on the outside and it changes the angle of which the steering axis runs through the head tube so it will of course slightly decrease reach but it will also increase wheelbase so these headsets can adjust the geometry of your bike by 1.4 or 1.8 degrees but because they're actually lowering the front end while slightly increasing the axle to crown height the 1.4, for instance, actually has an effective adjustment of about 1.7 degrees, I believe. So the system comes in at 99 US dollars. And I think, bang for buck, an angle adjust or a reach adjust headset can be one of the most effective ways to make your bike better suited to you and your riding. You know, bikes in any currency run into the thousands. So for just 99 US dollars, you can get it better suited to you. I think it actually represents quite good value and I think it's a great idea. So fair play to 9.8. So last piece of news now is actually the O-Chain Active Spider. Now this is something we referenced a little while ago, but it is now available for purchase in the UK. So we thought we'd revisit it. Basically, it's an active spider for your cranks, which has the aim of decoupling suspension and drivetrain forces. Because as a bike goes through its travel, the rear wheel can be pulling that chain on your chain ring, giving what we call pedal kickback. But this, using a system of elastomers, aims to eliminate that entirely. So it's very, very cool and could give that chainless feel. Now, if you've never ridden a bike chainless, it's definitely worth experimenting with, even if only for a run, because it does feel, well, the small bump sensitivity tends to go through the roof and it's amazing at how much more active the suspension can be, especially on some bikes. Some bikes do tend to suffer more with pedal kickback than others, it has to be said. It isn't necessarily cheap at 280 pounds in the UK, but yet again, similar to that 9.8, I think it's a really cool idea and it's great to see people tackling these sorts of problems. Now get in the comments guys, have any of you ever ridden chainless and what did you think of it? It is kind of disconcerting at first, you know, that lack of feedback can kind of feel a bit unstable, but over the rough stuff, it does feel pretty good indeed. So now it is time for the tech quiz. So first question, NV composites are synonymous with carbon wheels, but what were they called before NV? The second question, earlier on we mentioned Orbea, but which country are Orbea based in? And the last question, TRP is the racing arm of which company? The RP actually stands for racing products. There's a bit of a clue. So tune in later on for the answers. All right, now it's time for Bike Cave. This is where you send in some pictures of your bike caves. That could be a garden shed, it could be a garage, it could be a bedroom, it could be a wardrobe, it could be in the back of the van, literally anything you have. And it doesn't have to even have to be yours. If you haven't got a bike cave, but you've been to one that's really good, provided that that person is okay with you taking photos, send them in. And we're gonna include in this bike shop workshops. Give some props to your favorite local bike shops. Show us their workshops, show them why. Uh, show everyone why they're so good. Let us know. There's a link here and there's a better one in the description underneath that you can click on and that'll take you through to our uploader. So first up this week is from, if you bear with me, it says, hi, my name's Ian, this is my bike cave. Where are you based in? Let's have your details. So Manchester. Guys, this is my home garage bike cave. As you may have noticed, the car lift doubles up as a handy workbench. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Yeah, no way. Um, nice. All right, so you've got fairly heavy duty it looks like a shipping container can't quite tell from here it looks like a part shipping container with a wooden roof that's pretty cool okay so you know nice cage windows on there yeah i can see that you put the old scissor lift up in the background there hey that's a that's good double usage uh, nice giant as well there by the way uh, decent bike that trance three and look at that massive mac tools double roll cab down the back Whoa. So you're clearly into your cars then if you've got that sort of setup in your garage. I've got a few friends of mine have got scissor lifts and stuff as well. And uh, yeah, they're no strangers to a few tools, that's for sure. Okay, next up is from um, Ian in Londudno, Wales. Londudno, <laughs> sorry, my bad. Um, I've probably pronounced it wrong anyway. I'm terrible, I'm really sorry. Um, 
don't kill me too much in the comments. I apologize profusely. Uh, next up, he goes, uh, hey, Dolly, just finished watching your show and you asked for pizzas, camper vans, and bike caves. So here's mine. It's a 2004 Transit minibus. Dude, they're awesome. Massive. Uh, converted it last year. It sleeps three adults and can easily fit four bikes and gear for everyone. All right, let's have a look. We've got massive rack on the top as well. So I guess you could put kayaks and all sorts of stuff up there uh, and anyone behaving badly. There's a little workshop at the back. That's age for stashing the bikes in. Front wheel off, in they go. Always the best way to be honest, because you can rack up more like that, um, whether, you, whether you have to do it for that reason or not. Now let's have a look at the camper set up in here then. I always like a camper van. I'll definitely own one at some point. Nearly convinced the wife it's a good idea to get a transporter or something, but uh, we shall see. Loving the worktops. They look almost a little bit like these. They look like oak work tops. They <laughs> look really nice. Love the little compact sinks as well. Um, I actually was after one of those for there, but ended up getting that one for whatever reason. It was cheap or something. But mate, that's lovely. You've done a really good job on the inside of here. And I love the fact you wouldn't know from the outside. That's kind of the best thing about doing out a van yourself rather than having a swanky one like a, a California or something is you look at it, looks like a standard van. You go on the inside, it's like a luxury home. Look at that. That's amazing. Work well done, Ian. I'm super envious. You've got a great space in the back of there. Really usable space as well. Oh, and there's the sort of the illustration. Nice. Awesome. Thank you for that. Next up is from Rick in Half Moon Bay, California. No way. I've driven through there a few times. That's where Mavericks, the big wave is. That's where that breaks, isn't it? Uh, awesome. Apparently that place is famous for its uh, annual pumpkin festival, what it used to be. Uh, there's a random fact that I'm recycling a fact here because that was from Riding Giants, the documentary. If you haven't seen Riding Giants, watch it. It's absolutely amazing. What a film. Uh, documentary. Um, loving this, so new tool wall and new bench. Yeah, man, look at the size of that tool wall. And I love the hiking, not advised, downhill bike trail. Yeah, we need some of those for our local woods that you, you may be not supposed to ride in. We could do with some of those signs. That'd be quite good for in there. Nice pair of Fox 32s up on display as well. Your desktop. Ooh, are you a Tesla owner? Uh, you're in California and you've got a Tesla sign, so maybe you are. And um, that would fit very well. Some hard hats at the top there. So maybe you do some sort of construction as well. Like it, mate, really like it. Loving the chair as well. Looks awesome. You've got a running machine as well. A bit of a treadmill setup going on. Dude, that's one of the most impressive tool boards I've seen. You normally see them stretched out across the top of a workbench, not as just one big unit with absolutely everything on there. Looks great. Awesome work, Rick. And there's your, uh, your sunglasses compartment as well. That is pretty sick, liking that. And you've got trail dog as well. Trail dog with a bandana. That's like a triple win. You can't look at it much better than that, can you? And there's more tools over there as well. Flipping it, you've got loads of tools, dude. What a setup, wow. So uh, I take it you're in a mountain biking more than surfing then. Um, <laughs> oh my God, look how much gear you've got. Major tool envy. Wow, so you've got a double, single, and a cab on the top. Two cabs on the top. Flipping heck, dude. You are seriously into your motorsport with all of that. Wow. Seriously impressive. Okay, well, um, I've got a bit of tool envy, so we're going to get out of the bike cave for this week. But uh, thanks for contributing, everyone. Uh, and apologies about that Welsh. Um, I, must, I must take some Welsh lessons. R RMD is actually Welsh. She'll kill me for this. But, uh, see you next week. Okay, now it's time for top mods, where we get to see what you've been doing to your bikes. Uh, that could be putting a little customized headset cap on it. It could be literally anything. It doesn't matter. Whatever you do to your bike to make it a bit different from how it came as standard, that's what we want to know. All the little personalizations, because we know that your own bike is always better than the one you get off the shop floor, even if really it's not that much different. It's just a couple of little tweaks. Anything goes. Take some pictures, do us a little video tour of your bike, and we'll put you on the show. Same thing applies. Click through the link here. Come on, get involved. I showed you my bike on last week's show. Show me your bikes. Show us what you've done. Even if it's a small thing that you might think is not that significant, I bet it is. It makes your bike difference. It's got to be good. Uh, this week, you've got a bit of a special one because a friend of mine that runs a company called Full Factory Suspension, well, it was hammering with rain and he had to stay in because he's waiting for clients to drop some products around. And he was literally drumming his fingers. What can I do today? So he did what any sort of sane person would do. And he built a wheel. This is it using cable ties. <laughs> yeah, absolutely ridiculous, isn't it? Yeah, don't worry. He knows that it's probably not a safe thing to do. He just wanted to see if he could. And he said to say that he is gonna be using all of these cable ties again. It's not waste, okay? 
but as a work of art that is pretty insane he's actually laced up an entire wheel with nothing but cable ties now I don't know if I've got the guts to try this, but I'm tempted to put it on the front of the bike just to see if this thing will go round. Um, it seems to be like pretty well tensioned. If you think how spokes actually work, it's not down to any one's individual strength uh, on supporting the load of the hub. This bike has to support it from bottom as well. This is probably the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen anyone do. But fair play to him because he's an absolute genius mechanic. His name's Finn. Uh, big ups to Finn from Full Factory Suspension if you're watching this. I, I think this is crazy and this is typically you to do some bizarre things but it's given me a cool idea ages ago when i first started on gmbn i made a cable tie hacks video it's a pretty popular video uh, the boom cable tires one do you remember that boom cable tires i feel like i should make another one now i can't beat that without your help so give me your great hacks out there and we're gonna see if we if I can make them and maybe if we can make them better. Let's have a bit of fun with this. So send us your cable tie hacks. Let us know in the comments underneath. Use the hashtag cable tie hacks. Let's get this one whirling around and see what you can make and do and fix and bodge and hack using cable ties. But I challenge you, can anyone out there do better than that? Because I just don't think it's possible. I think that is astonishing. That's a work of art, even if it's useless. <laughs> And welcome back to Rewind. This is where we go back to see where all the cool stuff we ride now started. Had to start somewhere. Now, some of you might find this a bit hard to watch because you just look at the old stuff, you think it's terrible. Yeah, to a degree, some of it was, but it gave birth to all the amazing tech we have today. So we're here to celebrate old school stuff. So if you've got anything old school, if you're old school, if you've got any pictures, any video clips, magazine cutouts, anything goes, send them in and get in touch in the comments. Um, use that hashtag rewind for anything rewind related. The same with the rest of the show, top mods and bike cave, anything related in the comments, let us know about it. If you want to know where anything started out, you know, coil shocks and different pivot placements and suspension designs and full face helmets or whatever, literally anything, um, let us know and we'll try and dig up some old stuff from, I've got some stuff stashed away and we've got friends who've got everything stashed away. We'll bring it all out and we'll tell you the full story. But this week, first up, this is from Jack in Chester. This is his 1997, yeah, a long time ago, uh, Saracen Killy team. Now, don't confuse Saracen now with Saracen then. Saracen then was a company born in Warwick, um, British company, born and bred, lovely bikes. Uh, not to suggest that they aren't at the moment, but somewhere in the middle along the way, the company didn't do very well. Um, and then in more recent years, they got bought out again. Now, the Saracen you, hit, you see today, the bikes are incredible, uh, just the same as they were in very different ways but it's a completely different company. Um, it's nothing to do with what happened in the middle years, which is kind of, well, let's just not talk about that. We'll bring up enough time. But this is when Saracen were good the first time around. Danny Hart's riding Saracen when they're great this time around. So this is a 1997 Saracen Killy team. Classically made from steel. It's got the wishbone on the rear, a rigid fork. So I had a Killy Pro Elite. That was 1993, 1994. Uh, but it looks almost identical in styling to this. Richie Force like bars on there. Really nice looking bit of kit, to be fair. Lovely classic looking frame, good color too. And that one's got the Team Saracen colors on it. Uh, Jack, I really like the coloring of that bike. That would match something I have hanging up over there. We'll get to that in another video soon. Uh, nice to see it. Next up's from Bob. This is 1998 Santa Cruz Heckler. So the Heckler was their second full suspension bike. The first one was called the Tasman. Um, the Heckler was uh, basically a revised version of that. I've got to say, I still have a bit of a thing for the Tasman. Uh, Paul Smith, they used to work at MBUK before my time there. And I did work for him for a short time. He used to have one in yellow and it was just one of the most gorgeous bikes I'd ever seen. And it was a Santa Cruz. When Santa Cruz existed then, it was just like you never saw them. They were so rare, they were like hen's teeth. Uh, of course, they're everywhere now, but for good reason, they're really good bikes. Um, the Heckler was a four inch travel bike. It was a do anything bike. You could do cross country on it. You could do downhill on it. It was just like, the all-mountain hero back then. And I've got to say, that frame still looks pretty good now. A lot of people have kept that same frame design, you know, this classic single pivot. Orange bikes notably have got uh, their own take on that because they found that they, they've just improved it slowly over the years by changing the pivot placement and a few other things, but um, they found they never needed to go anywhere else because it works perfectly for them. And I bet that still feels good today. Very cool to see with the XTR and air, the V brakes. Uh, what shock have you got? Now you say SRAM shock, so I guess it's got rock shock shock, but can't see it. But great selection of pictures 
of that bad boy. And now it's over to Charles for his 96 Breezer. So we've had 97, 98, now 96. That's right, Breezer. So that is from Joe Breeze, one of the founding fathers of mountain biking. Uh, yeah, you could buy Joe Breeze bikes known as Breezers. So uh, Jetstream is all original components, even the grips, just like the 1996 Breezer catalogs. The grips, sadly, are dry rotted. The saddle is scuffed up, everything else in great condition. Um, the tires are not original, but I do have a set of Richie Z Max tires, which would have been on the bike when new. Things noteworthy. Uh, Breezer branded the excellent Japanese steel tube set as Breezer Diffusion. The Breezer backdraft rims are also Japanese, and Japanese make amazing stuff. In fact, the camera that this is being filmed on is Japanese, uh, and it's flipping good. I know what they're doing, I tell you. Um, gold nipples from Wheelsmith in the US were standard. XTV brakes are quite good. Um, yeah, they are quite good. Uh, I'm not gonna read all this because it's got a load of cool stuff going on here. But there's that saddle. Let's look at all your detail shots. Really nice to see. Yeah, there's those backdraft rims with the UK Japan logo on them. Man, they look cool. And I love that classic Breezer head tube badge, uh, like Marin County. I guess that's replicating Marin County with the sunshine there. Yeah, there's those grips, classic foam grips, avid brake levers. I've got one of those levers up here, actually. Um, right there, random. Yeah, the diffusion tube set on there. Oh man, look at it. Look how classic that frame is. And I kind of like the hot rod style paint job on there as well. With the, uh, it's almost like pinstripe, isn't it? Really nice looking bike. Look at the length of that stem though. I mean, that would be unforgivable if that was a modern bike, but uh, that's how it was back then. And even that fork, that Judy fork, blends in perfectly in that colorway. Yeah, really, really nice bit of kit there. Thank you for sending that in. Uh, next up's from Daniel, and he went to the Hope Factory. Wicked, so up in Barnoldswick in um, North Yorkshire, yeah. So, what did you say here? I saw these, a visit to Hope Factory. Amazing to see these old school bikes again. I did not know that they had either of these bikes in their factory. I need to go and visit them myself. They're a great bunch of guys and girls. Cannondale Fulcrum, that thing is like, honestly, that is like rocking horse turd. You just do not see those bikes. That is ultra rare. Wow. Really cool to see that, although that one looks different. It doesn't look like it's got the full gearbox set up on it. It used to have like a jack shaft system. That one doesn't look like it has it on there. And you've got the Pace downhill bike as well with the Monster fork on there. That's got the original head rims, Tioga tires, Tioga seat. Man, what a piece of kit. Look at that. Oh, and there's another shot of that Cannondale. So that must have been a much later iteration of it where they've kept the, the dual linkage on the rear. Uh, that was arguably one of the first bikes with short links. So it's technically a four bar because it's got two sets of linkages on it, but uh, they have short bars. So before you used to see uh, the Santa Cruz and you know, VPP from Outland and brands like that. So that was one of the earlier ones that used to use that. Very cool to see. Man, did not know that I had those tucked away. If anyone from Hope is watching, I would love to come and visit at some point and see you guys. Um, in the meantime, see you soon. So the quiz answers. Envy were actually originally known as Edge Composites. So a bit of a throwback, a fair few years for that one, but I'm sure some of you got it. The second question, Orbea are based in Spain. And the last question is Tektro. It's Tektro racing products. So Tektro are a huge manufacturer, but mainly focus on the OE or original equipment market. But TRP is their high-end racing products. So very exciting. And of course they have some big names riding their products now. They've got some drivetrains coming out as well. Now that is it for this week's GMBN Tech Show. So thank you very much for watching. Please consider subscribing to the channel as it really helps support us. And get in the comments. I want your thoughts on riding chainless. Have you ever tried it? And could you notice that much difference? Thank you again and we'll see you next time.